Okay, Sandra, you can go ahead. Okay, well, welcome everyone to Shemo Remote. We don't, we are remote, but we don't feel remote, especially when we're together uh, for to to hear uh, uh, a speak speech a speech, and see the the person, although uh, remotely. Uh, but I don't like to even use the word remote for us uh, Shemalites because we don't exactly feel remote. I'm going to turn uh, the um, intro uh, giver, uh, uh, I'm going to turn over the, the uh, mic for him. It's Jeff Gingrich, our provost and a good friend of us and of uh, David uh, to do the introduction. So here he is, Jeff. Great. Thank you, Sandra, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I, um, I, I know some of you, and um, I know many of you are regular active attenders and, of the Shemmel Forum, and, and so glad you could be with us today. And it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. David Myers, who many of, many of you know. Uh, David's no stranger to the University of Scranton, and in, in fact, one of our most well-known former students, I think. Uh, David completed his first year of college at the University of Scranton. Scranton after entering his third year of high school. And I think um, Sandra mentioned actually that David's not actually a high school graduate. So do we call him a high school dropout because of that? Uh, but, but we're very proud of the fact that he came to the university and he did pretty well for himself after coming to the university for a year. After uh, his first year at the university, he entered Yale Universe, Yale as a sophomore, went on to graduate from Yale then went on to study graduate studies in Jew modern Jew Jewish history at Tel Aviv University in Israel. After two years there, spent some time in Harvard and eventually went to Columbia University where he completed his dissertation with distinction, which later became his first book, Reinventing the Jewish Past, European Jewish Intellectuals and the Zionist Return. And we could go on and on. David's accomplishments since then are, are just so many and too many to mention. He's currently the Sadie and Ludwig Kahn Professor of Jewish History in the UCLA History Department, as well as the director of the UCLA Luskin Center for History and Policy. He also serves and spends a lot of time, I know, as president of the board of the New Israel Fund. He's written extensively in the fields of modern Jewish intellectual and cultural history, with a particular interest in the history of Jewish historiography. historiography. And I know he's no stranger to the Shemmel form on many occasions. I think many of you know, beyond all of these other accomplishments, that he is also the proud son of Sandra and Maury. And I want to particularly thank David today for all the work that he did last year as we work to, uh, to develop funds. And I wanna thank so many of all of you as we work to, de to, uh, to develop funds for the Sandra and Maury Myers Fellowship, which we're really looking forward to some spectacular uh, people in, in the future to speak on behalf and in, uh, in celebration of Sandra and Maury. Today, David will speak on the topic, anti-Semitism, past, present, and future. David describes anti-Semitism as the longest hatred in history. And as you all know, we're living in a time right now that it has been unfortunately fraught with racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, hatreds of all sorts in many ways. The Jesuit tradition that we have at the University of Scranton is known to prepare all of our students as people for others. The Abrahamic religions support the notion of loving our neighbors as ourselves. And now more than ever, we need to look more deeply into our propensity for, for hate, but also all the possibilities for love and peace. And so, so looking forward to David's talk today. It's a pleasure to have David as a personal friend. Uh, he, David gave me a wonderful tour of the Hill section uh, just a few weeks ago, actually, as a friend of the university and as today's speaker. David, thanks for joining us and we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Jeff. <clears throat> it's really a great pleasure to be here with you. Can you hear me okay? If just sort of give me a thumbs up. Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Provost Gingrich, for that warm introduction. Hi, Mom and Dad. Great to see you. Um, I didn't speak to you yesterday, Dad, but I spoke to you, Mom, so we'll talk later today. Um, 
Look, it's a, a time of challenge and opportunity in this country, a time of fear and of hope. Um, and in thinking of those challenges, um, I think the most immediate matter that comes to mind is the matter of a peaceful transition of power. Um, but then close at, close to after that, and indeed lurking over everything, is the COVID pandemic, which sadly reaches new heights every day. Um, among the challenges that we see in our time, in addition to those two, is the strange, surprising persistence of anti-Semitism, which, as Jeff said, has been described as the longest hatred. And there is um, a kind of haunting connection between the last two challenges that I just mentioned, namely anti-Semitism and COVID. And here I'm going to share my screen, if I may, um, and begin with uh, some PowerPoint slides. Um, you can sort of keep me focused um, from time to time as I speak in the upper right-hand corner of your screens. Um, let me just... Uh, okay. So... Um, what am I referring to, the connection between COVID and anti-Semitism? Well, the internet has been rife with outrageous claims that Jews are responsible for the, for the pandemic, that they caused it and sought to profit from it. And these are just a few of the images uh, that I uh, called from the internet. There are many internet um, making this claim, which is really part of a longstanding uh, assertion in anti-Semitic propaganda, which is to say that Jews operate in conspiratorial fashion to defraud or worse, poison the world. Uh, for example, the infamous blood libel was rooted in the claim that Jews poisoned wells to kill Christians or others. Jews killed Christians to use their blood for the ritual purposes. Uh, but the claim about killing uh, Christians by poisoning wells was uh, a popular explanation uh, in the mid 14th century in what is known as the Black Plague or Black Death. And of course, the most famous or infamous uh, sources of anti-Semitic propaganda ever fabricated, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion produced in the first years of the 20th century by members of the Russian secret po police um, captures uh, uh, beyond any other source we know the theme of a global Jewish conspiracy intent on uh, economic, political, uh, and social domination. The persistence of anti-Semitism <clears throat> is really a huge subject, um, and it deserves a course of its own, not a single lecture in one hour. Um, I teach a course on the history of anti-Semitism, and in, in, in the course of 10 weeks, I don't manage to cover it all. It's so wide-ranging. Um, we only have an hour, so what I'd like to do is try to address some of the following questions. <clears throat> Whence the term anti-Semitism? From where does it come? When did the phenomenon emerge? What forms did anti-Semitism assume historically? Why has it persisted? And where is it at today, especially in this country? Now, at the outset, I want to call our attention to two uh, persistent and contradictory features of anti-Semitism. One is its stunning malleability. Uh, that is to say, its ability to change forms, um, a stunning array of forms, and significantly often um, contradictory forms, such that from the same person, one can hear the claim that Jews are arch capitalists intent on world domination and revolutionary socialists intent on destabilizing uh, the world order. Um, you can ha hear echoes of that in uh, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the text um, in, at the center of your screen. So its malleability is one of its most consistent features um, and one of the keys to its success, namely the ability to change form again and again, to adapt to new circumstances and to find new rationales to accuse Jews of perfidy uh, and ill will. So that's the first characteristic, characteristic that I want to call our attention to. The other is um, at odds with that criterion of um, It is the essentialism of anti-Semitism. That is to say, its tendency to reduce the Jew to a single 
ineradicable quality, a quality that cannot be erased, uh, a single ineradicable nature. And I want you to bear in mind these two qualities as we try and think together about what can explain the persistence of this particular form of group, group hatred over not just centuries, but millennia. All right, let's start with the first of the questions I posed, which is um, whence the term anti-Semitism? We know that the phenomenon is old, and we'll talk in a bit about how old it is, uh, but the term we use, anti-Semitism, is a relatively recent one. Hmm. Trying to... Um, <clears throat> the term was first invoked in 1879 by a journalist by the name of Wilhelm Marr, who uh, was intent on creating what he called a League of Anti-Semites to combat what he saw as uh, the attempted takeover of his country, Germany, by Jews. Uh, that's an assertion he made in his book, The Victory of Judaism over Germandom or Germanness from 1879, the same year in which he went about creating a League of Anti-Semites. And we can talk about the nomenclature, the terminology, why, anti, why Semites to refer to Jews rather than just Jews. Um, but canonically, at this point, it was Mar who happened onto this designation. Now, mind you that Jews were about a half a million out of 45 million residents of the newly unified German Republic or empire. Um, they were, I think, less than 0.02% uh, of the population, uh, about 0 0.01. So a infinitesimal fragment of the population and yet held responsible uh, for an attempted takeover uh, of uh, the newly uh, constituted German empire. And I think this points to an important feature of anti-Semitism that we need to be mindful of from the outset, which is the dissonance between the perception of non-Jews, such as Mar, that Jews are all powerful, and the perception of Jews that they are a small, dispersed, and largely powerless group. Um, indeed, a group of pariahs, to use the famous term used by uh, Hannah Arendt in evocation of the French thinker Bernard Lazare. Uh, that is to say, outcasts on the fringes of society, not, in fact, at the center attempting to uh, take over uh, large and powerful countries. So when did this dissonance develop between the perception of non-Jews about Jews and the perception of Jews about themselves? What is the source of the deep suspicion, the deep fear, uh, the enmity uh, of non-Jews towards Jews? Um, what we know is that while the term anti-Semitism is relatively new, modern, uh, the phenomenon is not, as I suggested. And in fact, to go back and trace the origins of the phenomenon, we have to um, make our way back to antiquity. Um, we'll begin, though we, there's an, there is indeed a prehistory, a pre but we'll begin in the first century uh, of the Common Era, or AD, in Palestine, when we see diverse sectarian uh, movements emerging, uh, within Second Temple Judaism, uh, that is to say the Judaism that took rise after the return of exiles from Babylonia in the 6th century uh, BCE or BC. And one of those sectarian uh, movements uh, was a collection of followers of a wandering Jewish preacher and faith healer named Jesus. This was a movement, it should be said, uh, that emerged fully within Judaism of its day. But after Jesus' death, after Jesus' crucifixion, uh, underwent a process of sharpening separation from Judaism on a variety of grounds, on how to interpret the law, the Jewish law, um, often thought of as the Pharisaic law, um, differences based on uh, uh, divergences in ritual practice, and uh, eventually sharp theological differences as well. And I think it's fair to say, without reprising the entire history of first century Palestine, that there was an emerging relationship between Jews and followers of Jesus, who will come to be known as Christians, uh, of tension and even mutual contempt. Um, each of the two groups 
laid claim to the exclusive truth of monotheism. And I think it's an important point to make that uh, monotheists are in a sense unlike the polytheists of uh, the ancient Near East, who allowed for a measure of tolerance towards those who held different views. Monotheists believe in the exclusivity of their truth, and that almost of necessity generates very considerable tension amongst uh, competing groups of monotheists. Um, the dynamic between these two groups, let's see if this works, um, changes considerably in the fourth century um, uh, as a result of several developments. One is when the Roman emperor Constantine uh, converts to Christianity um, and legalizes it. Um, and in fact, ultimately begins the process of making Christianity the state religion, um, which has the effect of not simply uh, allowing for competition between Jews and Christians, but enfranchising one of those groups as thus a state power. And we see over the course of several centuries that that state power then introduced uh, laws directed against Judaism. The, uh, the monotheistic competitor of Christianity. Laws prohibiting uh, the size and height of synagogues or the building of new synagogues. Laws that even had to do with what sacred sources Jews could read other than the Old Testament, which of course was shared by both Jews and Christians. So this is one very consequential development in the fourth century. The other is the um, reflections and meditations of church fathers uh, on theological grounds about really how to conceive of uh, of Judaism, of this monotheistic competitor, and not just monotheistic competitor, but a monotheistic competitor for which church fathers and many Christians um, believe to be responsible for the most heinous of crimes, the crime of deicide, the, do, the, the crime of the death of the Christian God, of Jesus. What to do with them was the challenge that church fathers took up in the fourth and fifth centuries. Um, and there were various theological responses. Uh, amongst others, the great St. Augustine uh, weighed in um, with uh, some ruminations that emerged in what, in, into what has come to be known as the witness theory. Um, and the question that, uh, that prompted the development of the witness theory uh, was, why should Jews be preserved at all if they're guilty of perhaps the greatest capital crime there ever was, the crime of deicide? And eventually, church fathers with Augustine Lee developed this notion that Jews should be preserved so as to serve as witnesses to the ultimate truth of Christianity um, and to attest to the messiahship of Jesus upon the second coming. In that regard, it was necessary to preserve them, not to kill them off. Um, and here we see the first foundation of uh, the, Catholic, the, the Christian belief in the essential preservation of the Jews. This isn't to say that Jews should be kept in an exalted state. Indeed, um, if they were in a debased state, it would be uh, an indication of God's removal of grace from them. But they should not be eliminated from the scene. Um, and I think you can see here um, a deeply ingrained ambivalence towards the Jews uh, that becomes part and parcel of official Catholic church policy. Um, the essential use of the Jews to attest to uh, Jesus' uh, messiahship, but at the same time, the importance of uh, maintaining them in a debased state, uh, in a second class state, so as to uh, affirm the superiority uh, of Christianity. Um, this ambivalence, um, gave way to, I would say, a posture of enmity uh, and hostility as we move into the, uh, uh, the Middle Ages. Um, indeed, as we uh, capture the sense that Christians came to regard themselves as the new Israel, the heirs of the spiritual legacy uh, of monotheism that um, was first bestowed upon the Jews, but in the Christian view of things, had been lifted from them and bestowed now upon the Christians. And this is reflected really across Christian Europe in the Middle Ages um, in very graphic terms. Um, there are many 
uh, churches and cathedrals which bear uh, um, exemplars of this statue of Ecclesia Synagoga Church and Synagogue, which depict a kind of splendid church here uh, on the left, um, uh, looking up, holding a staff, um, uh, facing uh, the future with confidence, um, as opposed to a blinded uh, uh, synagogue um, where the staff is, or, or book is usually falling, indicating uh, the, the departure of grace, uh, of God's grace from, uh, from Judaism. <clears throat> um, so this is one of the kind of more um, formal architectural embodiments of that Christian attitudes towards Jews. Um, we know that in popular Christian imagination, there was an even more uh, uh, wild set of representations of Judaism, not just as uh, the downtrodden and blind, blinded synagogue, but um, as you can see on uh, the screen here, um, uh, as uh, possessed of diabolical or satanic qualities and even physical attributes. Um, there are many, many representations of Jews in uh, medieval Christian iconography uh, of, the, um, of the Jew as satanic, as diabolical. Um, <clears throat> the late scholar Joshua Trachtenberg devoted an entire uh, book to this question. Um, and you can see that on the left and read more about it in Trachtenberg's book. On the right um, is, you can't quite make it out, but a recently common uh, etching um, here uh, on a church in Germany that depicts Jews um, suckling um, the milk of a pig, uh, known um, by the derogatory term Judenzau, the Jews pig, um, playing with uh, the prohibition by Jews uh, to eat pigs. Um, this is a kind of common inversion that we see. Uh, something that was proscribed or prohibited um, in Judaism was inverted and made to be a regular feature uh, of Judaism in the eyes of uh, the popular, in the popular Christian imagination. Um, <clears throat> so um, anti-Jewish animus operates really at multiple layers in the Middle Ages, at the popular level, in this very vivid um, uh, set of imaginary images, and at the official level in that kind of second class status as uh, of Jews as debased, but not eliminated. <clears throat> um, throughout Jews play, I would a very important disproportionate role um, in the imagination of Christians um, as um, not just a theological figure, but also as a theological, social, and even physical other, indeed as the classic other in medieval Christian Europe. Um, <clears throat> and I would say that, that the roots of that, um, that othering, which begins as a process of theological othering, um, extends really up to the modern period um, and really um, comes to a definitive end um, only in 1965 with uh, the Second Vatican Council, which, uh, as you can see in uh, the text before you, um, refutes the idea that uh, whatever happened in the first century cannot be uh, cast upon the Jews for an eternity. Um, <clears throat> so you can see there's a kind of um, uh, uh, ambivalence of sorts in treating the developments of the first century themselves about whether Jews are or are not responsible for the death of Christ, but the stigma of uh, Jesus' murder of, of the crucifixion should not uh, remain with the Jews for uh, subsequent centuries. Um, the very rich repository of theological and physicalized representations of Jews in the Christian imaginary were um, supposed to come to an end in the 18th century, in uh, the Age of Enlightenment. And by that I mean um, Enlightenment thinkers believed uh, that it was their job as uh, the great French philosopher, philosopher Voltaire said to 
écraser l'enfant, to crush the infamy that is organized religion, and particularly the superstition that sits at the heart of it. And as part of the superstition uh, that animated organized religion, and especially the Catholic Church, uh, in the eyes of uh, the philosoph, was uh, the derogatory attitudes towards Judaism. This was to come to an end um, as uh, Enlightenment philosophers uh, propagated the belief that all human beings possessed equally of the capacity for reason and should not submit uh, to the superstitious and the hierarchical authority of uh, ecclesiastical officials. Um, there was a promise which Jews felt very palpably in the 18th century in Europe that the era, the long period of time in which they were the classic theological and social other in Christian Europe was uh, at an end. Um, and yet, it turns out, and this is an important part of um, the takeaway of our story, that societies need a reviled other to define themselves and to assert a sense of superiority. In Europe, even in the heart of the Enlightenment, Jews remained proximate, they were available, and they had a lot of experience as the classic other. Um, and they filled that function from this point forward, from the 18th century forward, um, as a minority that was close enough to be known, yet sufficiently alien to be hated. And here we come to an important question and really a transition in our understanding of that longest hatred, um, which is what were the grounds now uh, on which Jews were to be excluded and reviled? If religion and religious authorities no longer held the sway that they once did. In a modern, decidedly secular age, what were the grounds for the exclusion uh, of Jews, for the stigmatization of Jews, for the vilification of Jews? And here it's important to remember that religion did not disappear. It was transformed. It was privatized. And yet, as the great um, uh, uh, sociologist Jose Casanova reminds us, in recent times, religion has become deprivatized um, in many important ways. But new grounds had to be found as religion was undergoing uh, its own transformation through the prism of secularization. Um, and new grounds had to be found to perpetuate the status of Jews as others, or as Arendt says, as a caste. And here I just want to recommend to all of you who have not had a chance, uh, please take the opportunity to read Isabel Wilkerson's seminal book, Caste, which um, doesn't discuss um, at length Jews, but rather African Americans and America as an excluded caste. But nonetheless, there is a shared methodology in operating a caste system. So what were the grounds by which Jews were to be excluded? There had to be a new rationale if it was no longer religion or the crime of deicide in an enlightened secular era. And the answer can be reduced to one word, race. At the juncture of new discourses of nationalism and biology, right? think of Charles Darwin, race emerged as a vital determinant of not just individual, but group-based difference. A new language <clears throat> of race cloaked in the garb of science emerged um, with um, a whole industry of quasi-scientists, quasi-racial scientists taking rise to set up uh, a new hierarchy of racial difference. So in this emerging hierarchy, the status of Jews as other and inferior was confirmed. Um, this becomes not only the new uh, criterion or grounds for the exclusion of Jews in European society based upon that structural need for an other, it is also ineradicable. Whereas, as Hannah Arendt famously said, one could escape from Judaism through conversion, through this new modern form uh, of a racially defined Jewishness, there was no escape. Race was indelible. You couldn't erase it. You couldn't convert out of it. And in fact, in Germany, we know that many Jews tried to escaped the stigma of their Jewishness, and they converted to Christianity. And what happened? 
they became known as baptized Jews. That was their designation. Um, and yet while race is this new criterion uh, uh, of Jewish difference, the actual forms that anti-Semitism takes when Wilhelm Marr gives us this term are varied. What do I mean by that? Well, there's political anti-Semitism, such as Marr gave expression to, which maintains that Jews are intent, intent on political, political domination. As he wrote in his book in 1879, Jews were intent on uh, political domination in Germany. There is economic anti-Semitism. Jews are intent on capitalist or alternatively socialist domination. So for example, we see that in one of the most important pieces of anti-Semitic literature in the late 19th century, seven years after Wilhelm, Wilhelm Marr gives us the term anti-Semitism, uh, that is uh, Edouard Drummond's La France Juive, Jewish France, which makes the claim that Jews possess most of the world's capital and appetitively desire to uh, gather the rest of it in their hands. There is social anti-Semitism based on the belief, belief that Jews are intent on polluting the purity of other nations amongst whom they live. There even are renewed claims of religious anti-Semitism that irreligious secular Jews are intent on secularizing the pious Christian masses. So remember those qualities I mentioned at the outset, malleability and essentialism, right? Race gives us an ineradicable quality of uh, Jews, and yet there are multiple forms uh, of uh, anti-Semitism that appear at the same time. So um, this gives us an opportunity to pause for a second um, and to take stock of the phenomenon. Again, what allows for the persistence uh, of a group hatred that ultimately, and in fact, not just ultimately, but relatively soon after, right? Maher gives us the term uh, anti-Semitism in 1879. 60 years later, that term becomes the grounds for a writ of extermination for an entire people. What led the longest hatred to fuel that attempted extermination that came in the Holocaust? Now, that's a huge question, and it would take another lecture and indeed another course to discuss it. But there are a few factors that converged, I think, to create that combustible moment that I want to mention um, very briefly. So first there is, as we have seen, the enduring and yet changing nature of hatred of Jews. Second, the structural need of societies to identify a pariah in its midst. Third, as we see after the defeat of Germany in the First World War, after the great inflation of 1923, after the Great Depression uh, in the world after 1929, we see conditions of political, social, and economic instability, which are the ideal breeding grounds for uh, new forms or recurrent forms of group hatred and stigmatization. And to those qualities, we might also add a charismatic leader with a coherent ideology and a strong state mechanism to implement that ideology. Right? These are some of the factor, factors that converge that allow us to understand how this persistent form of group, group stigmatization, now possessed in 1879 of a new name, could become uh, this writ of extermination. But for today, we're going to have to leave uh, the Holocaust aside. Um, the question I want to turn to now is the fate of anti-Semitism after the Shoah, after the Holocaust. Uh, Shoah is the Hebrew term uh, for the Holocaust, which is often used interchangeably. Would not one imagine that the world would be shamed into banishing anti-Semitism after the Holocaust for an eternity? Well, as we know, that has not happened. Um, and it's particularly noticeable that this country, the United States, which lacks the deep roots of uh, anti-Jewish uh, sentiment that Europe possessed, has seen a dramatic rise in anti-Semitic expression and action over the last five years. Uh, last year, 2019, saw uh, the highest number of acts of anti-Jewish harassment, violence, and vandalism since 
the Anti-Defamation League um, began collecting statistics in, eight, in, in 1979. So every year, the Anti-Defamation League, one of the uh, country's most important um, defense organizations against anti-Semitism, anti um, since 1979, they've been chronicling uh, the number of anti-Semitic incidents. Um, and last year, 2019, uh, had featured the highest number, uh, over 2,000. Um, between 2015 and 2017, there was a 100% rise, uh, the ADL, or Anti-Defamation League, tells us, in anti-Semitic acts. And again, in the United States, after the Holocaust. Now, is it coincidence that this period of dramatic rise coincides with the uh, reign of Donald Trump? Um, I would suggest not. This is not to suggest that Donald Trump is an anti-Semite, though he has refer to Jews in terms that evoke traditional anti-Semitic imagery on numerous occasions. Jews are good with money. Jews are brutal killers in real estate transactions. Um, it is safe to say, however, I think, that the culture of vilification to which he contributed manifoldly falls back into familiar patterns. So where do the 2,000 or more recorded events uh, of anti-Semitism come from. Um, I think they come from that cultural vilification that we have seen, of which, to which Donald Trump is both uh, uh, a contributor and of which he is a symptom. Um, one of the places that we are told we see this new resurgent form of anti-Semitism in America is the college campus. Uh, some believe that the college campus has become a hotbed of anti-Semitic activity especially around activity that is deemed anti-Israel. Um, and this is particularly the case with what is known as the BDS movement, uh, the movement uh, uh, that uh, has as its main agenda um, an, a menu of options intended to place pressure on Israel, including boycotting, divesting from, or sanctioning Israel. Um, in fact, in a study just released by uh, the American Jewish Committee, 80% of American Jews said they believe that the BDS movement is somewhat or very anti-Semitic. Um, and the BDS movement, I should say, um, uh, is perhaps most um, popular in this country on college campuses, uh, the site of uh, progressive and radical political activism. <clears throat> that said, now to go from the American Jewish Committee to the Anti-Defamation League report, the ADL report, which chronicles of the actual numbers and sites of anti-Semitic acts, only 9%, which is far too many, but nonetheless a small fragment, 9% of the recorded anti-Semitic events in 2019 occurred at colleges and universities. Um, and so statistically, the university is, or college is not a major site of anti-Semitic acts. Um, the question that I think we want to uh, addressed for just a minute now as I sort of move toward the final part of my, my talk is uh, what actually can be deemed anti-Semitic. Is it anti-Semitic to support the BDS movement? Is it anti-Semitic as a college student or faculty member to call Israel's control of the West Bank an occupation? Is it anti-Semitic to call Israel's control over the lives of two and a half million Palestinians on the West Bank with separate sets of um, of physical infrastructures and legal systems, racist or colonialist. Uh, by way of analogy, we might ask, what is the nature of the offense if we call America racist or colonialist? Um, and part of what I want to suggest here is that uh, it can be deeply wounding for students who are very connected to Israel, particularly Jewish students, to hear these kinds of things said about Israel. Um, I see it. Many of these students are my students um, with whom I'm very close. But is it anti-Semitic to call Israel a racist regime? Is it discriminatory to the point that it requires legal intervention, um, as some have suggested, and indeed as um, the Trump administration set in motion? Um, 
So as someone who lives his professional life on a college campus and who cares deeply about Jewish life on my campus, I'm not all at all certain that these expressions are anti-Semitic in the main uh, or discriminatory, discriminatory to the point of requiring uh, legal protection. Um, and here, what I, I think it's important to do is to look at these phenomena through a different set of eyes. Um, I often look at the question through the eyes of Jewish students, but I also try to look at it through the eyes of my Palestinian American students, um, for whom it looks very different. Uh, for a good number of them, they identify strongly with that same homeland. They see BDS not as a means of denigrating Jews, but as a nonviolent movement that seeks to overcome uh, the long deferred quest of Palestinians for national self-determination by pressuring Israel to bring an occup the occupation to an end. So I think it's important to uh, have on these dual sets of lenses when we look at this question. I personally am not a supporter of the BDS movement, um, but I don't think that it is necessarily anti-Semitic, and I don't think that we should engage um, in legal actions to ban it, um, because I think that um, A, may be counterproductive, but B, um, may come into tension with our principles of free speech. I've spent a fair bit of time on this particular feature uh, of the current conversation about anti-Semitism in America, but I want to contrast uh, the BDS movement and um, the assertion that anti Israel expression anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic uh, to what I see as a far greater threat, to what the Trump Department of Homeland Security called uh, just a couple of months ago the greatest threat, uh, terrorist threat to this country, which is white supremacists. Um, white supremacists uh, are those who marched in Charlottesville in the summer of 2017. Um, when, as we recall, um, President Trump maybe misspoke when he said that there are very fine people on both sides. Uh, it was a white supremacist um, who attacked, uh, who undertook the murderous assault of the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, in which 11 Jewish worshipers were killed. And it was a white supremacist who attacked a synagogue just last year in 2019 in Poway, California, killing a Jewish worship worshiper there. I think concern. Uh, white supremacy is alive and well in this country. We see it in the Proud Boys. We see it in the Boogaloo Boys. We see it in one of the most prominent uh, sources for information for the white supremacist world, um, an online site known as the Daily Stormer, which draws inspiration from the uh, Nazi propaganda rag known as Der Sturmer, um, the Stormer. Um, what we learn um, is that at the heart of the ideology of white nationalists, even more than anti-black racism, which is so central to the worldview, is hatred for Jews. A belief that Jews are avaricious, selfish, and intent on world domination. Uh, and you can see this on the right in uh, the Daily Stormer, the Daily Stormer's uh, um, uh, advertisements and, and uh, promotional materials. Um, and um, you can see it yourself if you go online. There's some incredulous and yet fatiguingly familiar about what we see today in this white nationalist version of anti-Semitism. And yet, as we assess the long career of anti-Semitism, we arrive, I think at last, at the conclusion that anti-Semitism is not only about, maybe not even really about Jews. It's really about a majority society and its own sense of inadequacy and the concomitant need for a stigmatized other. That need, as I've suggested, arises in times of political, social, and economic instability such as the present moment. This is a sobering and really depressing realization 
But I think there's a silver lining, and with this, I will conclude. While Jews may have been stigmatized most consistently, they are by no means the only groups to be stigmatized, including in today's current culture of vilification. African Americans, immigrants, Muslims, LGBTQ people are also victims of this culture of stigmatization. This makes them natural allies of Jews in fighting against the deep malady of group hatred in our midst. Now, I think more than ever, we need solidarity to fight against these forces of injustice and hatred. And it's not just the responsibility of those groups who are stigmatized, it's really all of our responsibility. Indeed, the long history of anti-Semitism teaches the importance of vigilance, of steadfastness, of empathy, and activism. Now, more than ever. Thank you. Happy to entertain any questions you might have. <clears throat> I, I do have a question, if I may. Yes, please. Uh, what do you, I have numerous questions, but I'm able to start with one. But what do you think of, um, I think it was David Engel, NYU's argument recently, but not exclusively recently, uh, on the here, I guess, heuristic value of the term anti-Semitism, because uh, I believe he advocates in, in recent Hebrew publications um, to sort of cease its use. Michael, you're following Hebrew language scholarship very well. Um, indeed, um, the NYU historian David Engel <clears throat> um, um, published a piece, actually in English about a decade ago, um, which became uh, the focus of a two-volume issue of the journal Tzion, the flagship journal of the Israeli Historical Society, based around his claim that the term anti-Semitism um, should be dispensed with because uh, it means so many different things to so many people. Um, and it generated a very animated um, discussion among scholars that took up two full uh, issues uh, of the journal at Sion. Um, I understand where Engel comes from. Um, I think, um, in a certain sense, his view misses the point. Um, it's precisely the multifarious, um, multitudinous, um, almost endless uses uh, of the term. It's precisely its malleability that I think gives it its distinctive feature. Um, and I think we would lose something uh, very significant um, both um, as uh, scholars engaged in the analytical uh, labor uh, of necessary and as activists intent on fighting against anti-Semitism if we did what he proposes, which is to localize it um, and come up with a much more fragmented taxonomy uh, to identify um, you know, Polish anti-Jewish expression um, in its particular language and uh, German anti-Semitism in uh, the late 19th century in its own language and Muslim anti-Semitism um, in its own uh, particular nomenclature. To my mind, that would uh, be first ineffectual, but I also think uh, analytically would miss really um, one of the defining characteristics of anti-Semitism as I've laid it out, its malleability. I mean, I think if we lose uh, the power of its malleability, we lose a great deal of the understanding of its persistence. Um, uh, of its staying power. Um, uh, you know, it, we might want to prescribe that kind of fragmentation um, as a way of disaggregating it and, uh, in a certain sense, uh, forestalling its, uh, its unceasing forward momentum, its unceasing forward march. Um, but I don't think anal analytically or historically it's warranted, and I'm not sure um, that, you know, we're at a point where, uh, where it makes sense to, to engage in, in that localization. Thank you. I see my father has a question. You have to unmute, Dad. We go through this almost nightly, just so you know. 
Did you hear me? Bob Wright. Okay. Well, while my parents get there, uh, unmute, we'll go ahead with you, Bob, please. Uh, I'm just talking about James Carroll yep. and his, his work on the relationship between Catholics and Jews. And I detect both cynicism or perhaps not cynicism, but uh, frustration and some sense of progress in terms of the relationship. Um, do you have any comments on that in terms of? Yeah, I'd like to recommend to all of you that you read James Carroll's uh, seminal book, Constantine's Sword. Oh, uh, yeah. James Carroll is a former um, uh, Catholic <laughs> priest, uh, journalist, historian, um, who, amongst other uh, books, uh, wrote Constantine's Sword, which is a history of the Catholic Church, Church's attitude towards the Jews, really a history right. of Catholic anti-Semitism. Um, He's also really, I think, a, a uniquely courageous um, warrior in uh, the battle to confront one's own inner demons, um, as he does in his own faith tradition. Um, I should say that uh, as a general matter, I think, um, you know, when it comes to um, group hatred and, uh, and long simmering conflicts, usually the first step that needs to be taken is the work of self-criticism, looking inside one's own uh, to see uh, where the, uh, the pathology lies. Um, and James Carroll has done that. Um, and at the end of Constantine's Sword, he raises the really interesting question about what should be done with those passages of the Gospels that may perpetuate Christian anti-Semitism. Should they be um, ex expunged? Should they be expurgated? Um, or should they be, should they remain as a source for ongoing conversation and confrontation? Um, and it seems to me that he is wise in suggesting uh, that they need to be present um, in order to come to terms uh, with that long history uh, of uh, Christian and church-based anti-Semitism. So I regard James Carroll um, as an exceptionally learned and brave fighter in uh, this struggle for justice that begins by looking within one's own. Um, and um, it's a principle that I try to apply um, in my own work um, in thinking uh, about uh, Israel, Palestine, um, and just um, a Jewish way of being in the world. Yeah, David. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. David, you described a, the, a characteristic of uh, anti-Semitism as its malleability, but that's only a characteristic. What is it that the impetus that of the persistence that commits itself to being malleable? Right. So, you know, I've tried to lay out what I think um, uh, help us understand the persistence. Um, I, I must confess, although I've studied it for years and others have studied it even more intensely than I have. I don't have a simple answer. I think, um, I mean, even before the advent of Christianity and the advent of that deeply entrenched hostility between uh, Christianity and Judaism, um, we saw anti-Jewish expression um, in, um, in first century um, uh, 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 Rome, um, Egypt, um, we see um, anti-Jewish uh, acts, um, assertions of Jewish clannishness, uh, appetitiveness, uh, desire for uh, political p power beyond their, uh, beyond their needs. Um, it was, so I'm going to try and answer the question as best I can. Um, I think monotheism is part of the answer. Um, I think the assertion of um, an exclusive claim to truth um, induces anxiety and resentment. Um, uh, it also lends a group um, a sense of distinctiveness, which may lead it to separate itself from others. This is the claim of the famous 17th century 
uh, Dutch Jewish renegade, Benedictus Baruch Spinoza, who said the following, that Jews um, segregated themselves through the laws that they received um, in Revelation. Um, those laws held together their political state when there was a Jewish commonwealth. But after the commonwealth uh, uh, disappeared, they continued to hold on to those laws and segregated themselves. And that segregation brought down upon them the hatred of the Gentile world. And that hatred of the Gentile world here in a uh, kind of fascinating move, Spinoza suggests, served to reinforce Jewish self-distinctiveness, a Jewish sense of identity. So I think monotheism is part of the answer. The competition between two monotheistic creeds, um, uh, such as we see um, in um, uh, the first century of the Common Era, the accusation of deicide, and then the structural role that Jews come to play based on that uh, theological stigma. Um, the, th the stigma of the Jews does not remain exclusively theological. It, it, it migrates into the realm of regular social interaction, um, such that we have a very powerful model um, already in place in medieval Christendom. Um, it would have been easy, and we would not be here discussing the uh, phenomenon if Jews had simply disappeared, but they persisted um, through a kind of remarkable uh, turn of fate. Um, they persisted, they survived, they adapted, they proved themselves malleable in response to the malleability of, mm -hmm. uh, of anti-Semitism. And they continued to be present. Um, in addition to all that I've just suggested, the competition between monotheistic creeds, the claim of deicide, uh, the transformation of theological stigma into social stigma, I think we have to point to that structural or functional factor, the need of societies for a foil against whom they can measure their own greatness or superiority. And Jews have been extraordinarily convenient um, and well-placed to assume that role. As we know, not just Jews, especially in modern times, but Jews as well, including and up to the greatest form of organized mass murder ever undertaken in the Holocaust. Um, these are some of the answers I can come up with, um, but I feel like a full answer you know, still eludes us. Thank you. Um, I do have a question, David. <clears throat> do you think that all societies require to have a lesser uh, a, a, a society that's less than they are, that, that that's as much a habit or, or a necessity to, I, should, I shouldn't use the word necessity, but a trait that exists in almost all society. Yeah, I mean, if you look across you know, the, the globe, and if you read Wilkerson's um, discussion of caste, um, it's a phenomenon that exists you know, from, from the Middle East to India to, uh, to the Americas. Um, this seeming need to order society in hierarchical fashion. Um, and identify at least one group as, um, as distinct, as an ontological matter, as a matter of actual being or essence from others. Um, I think that's a phenomenon that um, you know, may not be um, uh, ingrained in uh, the DNA of ancients or medievals, but certainly became a deeply ingrained social practice. And maybe in Lamarckian fashion, um, I'll ask uh, the scientists to forget everything I'm just about to say, became ingrained into the social DNA as well uh, of societies. So I think that that is a, historically, if we were to look historically, we will see that phenomenon really across societies, language and, languages, and time periods, such that I, I think we can say it's, it's a recurrent feature. Um, Jews have been present uh, as a uh, diaspora people in many uh, places across the globe. Um, and in many of them, they have played 
um, really a variety of roles. Um, they have played the roles of reviled but still necessary economic middlemen. They have played the role of translators um, and transnational merchants, but, uh, and, and those roles allowed them to develop um, adaptive mechanisms to respond quickly, but it also has to be said that in many of those places, they also found themselves at the bottom of the social hierarchy. Um, uh, and in that regard, I think, yes, societies almost need that mm. marginalized pariah in order to define themselves mm -hmm. in ways that accord them the requisite dignity uh, to sustain. So, and Jews are available. Available, proximate in so many yeah. places around the world. Mm -hmm. Not all, yeah. by any stretch of the imagination, but so many. And I have a question. <laughs> uh, Sister yes. Carol up here in 44. Uh, <laughs> so nice to see you. Good to see you too. You laid out a depressing history um, about anti-Semitism, but you haven't said anything to us about um, how we might uh, work to overcome this and uh, what we might do to um, fight against anti-Semitism. I'm sure you've thought about this, and I wonder if you have any suggestions. Right. Well, it seems um, superfluous of me to tell you that a good place to start would be education, um, and education based on, you know, that hard-edged confrontation with the sources of one's own tradition. Um, I think um, you know we, we we have to encourage. Um, that self-critical faculty um, that is really the essential precondition to seeing uh, the humanity of the other. Um, so I would begin by saying that self-critical impulse um, is, is necessary to cultivate. Um, and as I began saying, I think education is extraordinarily important. Um, uh, it's really important to teach as you have done, uh, the history of the Holocaust. And I would say um, it's also important to teach the longer history of anti-Semitism, not only as a means of overcoming enmity towards Jews, but almost as a kind of um, praxis, as a, as a, as a method uh, to understanding what that kind of group stigmatization can do, uh, uh, to understanding um, how deeply ingrained it can be as a habit of mind, uh, as a way of being. Um, so the importance of that goes far beyond Jews. So I would um, sort of encourage the study of anti-Semitism as a case study uh, in the effort to overcome um, uh, group forms of group hatred that we see today. Um, you know, to really confront that impulse to define a classic other as a means of asserting one's own identity. Um, I alluded at the end of my presentation to what I think is a real key as well, in addition to inculcating that self-critical impulse and um, expanded education, um, especially as um, uh, memory of the Holocaust uh, from living survivors uh, becomes more distant. I think it's all the more important to ingrain uh, is this method and praxis of studying anti-Semitism in the Holocaust. But I really believe in uh, the importance of solidarity um, amongst uh, groups that have found themselves to be the victims of, uh, of marginalization and vilification. And here, um, it's important both to recognize what is distinctive, certainly in its duration, about anti-Semitism, but what is shared um, by other groups um, in society today. I mean, it's very striking to me, for example, to see um, how many of the issues and tensions that uh, Muslims in France are undergoing are similar to those which Jews underwent in the Enlightenment era. When Jews were told, sure, you can enter into French society, even as citizens, 
provided you leave behind all vestiges of your group identity, right? Provided you leave behind those superstitious religious rituals and, you know, the funny way you dress and the funny foods you eat and the funny languages you speak. Um, so I think, you know, the Muslim question, um, and to be sure there are differences between um, the Muslim question today and the Jewish question of the late 18th century, and there was no uh, radical uh, terrorist element within Judaism of the late 18th century, and there is in Islam today. But I do think that um, uh, understanding uh, that other groups have undergone or are undergoing similar kinds of uh, uh, stigmatization um, provides a path towards a new form of allyship, as they say today, solidarity and group activity. Um, and while maintaining some measure of precision about what is distinctive about anti-Semitism, I think it's also important to see um, anti-Semitism as one piece in the, in, in, in the one pillar of that foundation of societal stigmatization of the other. Um, and therefore, Jews alone are not going to be able to overcome uh, that impulse that I think is deeply rooted in society. Um, and that's going to require Jews themselves to surrender some sense of the exclusivity of Im the importance of the mission in combating anti-Semitism to understand that there are other injustices to fight today that are extraordinarily important. So um, that's the beginning, beginning of my answer of, of what kinds of things we might do or think about. Don't we have to look at racism? David? Absolutely. David? Yep. Um, a little different line of question, but I, I'm kind of thinking like a, a Venn diagram with a great degree of overlap, where on one hand you have criticism of Israel, and on the other hand you have um, criticism or attacks on Jews. And, and uh, I know the late rabbi Jonathan Sachs said that uh, expecting uh, of Israel that which you did not expect of other countries is, is a definitional form of, of anti-Semitism. Um, but my question is, um, is it possible? And if so, where does one draw the line of cr criticism of Israel? And also, uh, particularly on college campuses, um, is it possible to draw a line between free speech and um, the accusation of, of anti-Semitism? Or are we left with more or less the, uh, the Potter Stewart type of thing? We know it when we see it, but we can't really define it. Right. Oh, you know, David, I'm not surprised you asked the question. Um, sort of expected it. Um, and uh, I thank you for it um, because it just will allow me to think it through further with you aloud. Um, I have to actually give a talk on Thursday about what's going on on campus. And I don't have clarity myself. Um, um, I do think that uh, the executive order that President Trump issued in December, uh, extending coverage of uh, Title VII to include um, uh, discrimination against Jews as a national group and not just a religious group opens up some problems um, uh, insofar as it may um, brand someone who doesn't believe that the state of Israel should be a state of the Jews um, as anti-Semitic and liable to some form of uh, government um, uh, intervention. Um, and I mention that very particularly because I want to now sort of move directly into your question. So I think in my rendering, it's really, really hard to distinguish between criticism and anti-Semitism. Um, I think for me, what is really problematic is um, when one attributes the actions of one to the actions of the whole. So the actions of Benjamin Netanyahu become the actions of the Jewish people. Um, I think that begins to move into dangerous anti-Semitic terrain. Um, I think um, denying Jews the right to define themselves as a nation by arguing Jews 
are just a members of a religious group um, moves into um, terrain that I feel uncomfortable with. Though again, I'm not sure I would introduce um, new federal standards to uh, to enforce to, you know enforce uh, or punish on the basis of discrimination. I'm just sort of playing it out. I think there's a difference now to go to what I began with between saying. I don't believe that the state of Israel should be the state of the Jews, but rather it should be the state of all its citizens, and suggesting that the Jews have no right to be in that region and should just go home. The first um, position is for me a matter of sort of a political theoretical framework, and the other is basically denying the Jews the right to, to live and even survive. Um, so one is sort of, um, sort of what's the political framework of that polity and the other is, you know, do you have a, a, a right of existence? Um, so that's where we might begin to draw lines. Um, these may be too hair thin, too razor thin to satisfy, but I think um, it's really important to you know, engage in this very careful kind of work. I'm part of various groups that are trying to think this through and, and provide you know, the kinds of distinctions you're asking for. And even though these questions have been with us for decades, um, I still think we're trying to uh, produce the, the fine tooth distinctions. So I think that's task number one. Can we uh, distinguish between fierce criticism of Israel and that which um, that which we can agree on as anti-Semitism. That's number one. And then number two is what do you do about it? Um, what enforcement mechanism do you introduce uh, to, uh, to regulate that kind of expression? Um, and I think they're both really important questions. Um, maybe next year, in a year's time, I'll have more answers as, as, as uh, someone who's part of groups that are thinking these, these kinds of questions through. Uh, but I don't think there's real clarity. And I don't think many people have a lot of clarity. I don't think the extension of Title Seven has introduced a lot of clarity, nor do I think that um, the 32 uh, states that have um, essentially um, uh, banned BDS or banned government, uh, governments from engaging with anyone who supports BDS, I don't think that's really uh, moved the needle all, all that much. What I do want to say, um, by way of conclusion to my answer here, is that the fact that an assertion is deeply wounding, for example, Israel is a racist state, and offensive, does not necessarily make it discriminatory, discriminatory in um, a legal sense. Um, and that suggests there's just going to be a huge terrain uh, in which people are going to feel awful and uncomfortable. And I just don't know that the law can step in and sort of clear it up. I just don't know. Um, meaning, you know, it's bad to have something that you love and revere be called racist. Um, but I've seen the people who are doing that on my campus and in certainly a number of the instances, I know that they're not informed by anti-Semitism. They believe that Israel's regime of occupation is racist. So disagreement is not discrimination. And even wound and insult are not necessarily discrimination. Um, and I hope to have greater clarity on this um, uh, in a year's time, in, in, mo in several months' time. Uh, I want to invite you to weigh in to see if you have any clarity. Not, no, not really. I was, I'm, you know, it's a question that I think we we all grapple with, and um, the free speech question, um, even apart from Israel, it, it is always uh, difficult. Uh, where one draws the line, and and I, I know on college campuses, it's a it's a it's a big issue. I mean, uh, if you decide to have a white supremacist club where you know is there that are, is that something that's okay for a college campus or a uh, well 
I'll leave it at that, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm, uh, you know, there, there's that school that says shutting down the answer to uh, racist speech or, or whatever is more speech rather than shutting things down. But at some point, um, given what we know happened, you know, 80 years ago in Germany, um, our, to let it go uh, can have consequences and you can't see into the future as to where that might lead. Yeah, right. I, I, I agree. And I would say, I think, you know, this is really part of a larger conversation we need to be having about free speech in the era of, you know, uh, of fragmented and refractory and uh, offensive social media. Um, you know, we look at the media landscape and we see just these alternate universes. And within each of them, you have, you know, your own discourse. Some of them are, um, are connected. Um, ones that I'm sort of, that I see are sort of right-wing uh, mainstream media and far right. Sometimes there's a blurring of boundaries or at least a shared language. Um, and perhaps it's true on the left as well. I'm much more attuned to what's going on on the right. Um, I think there's a larger conversation that has to be made as we seek, you know, really reparative tikkun, repair of, of our broken political culture and world. Um, we really have to take on this question, I think, of is free speech as understood in the classic civil libertarian sense, you know, by the Erwin Chemerinsky's who, you know, are dogged in saying the, the, the antidote to bad speech is more good speech. Um, is that going to work with the internet? Can it work, you know, um, with something that has no regulation whatsoever? So that's one really important question that I think I'd put on the table and think, uh, uh, pose not as a question chiefly about anti-Semitism, but uh, really about uh, group hatred and, and speech in this country in general. Um, and, you know, um, we, as my mother chimed in, obviously we need to uh, place the question of racism front and center in that conversation. Um, the other thing I just want to, you know, as we move towards the end, I want to just emphasize um, this point that I made, for me at least, when we talk about anti-Semitism, the danger it poses, we place a disproportionate amount of attention on the college campus. I think we're missing uh, the point. The source of, well, which isn't say we should ignore it altogether, but let's be clear, the source of the most venomous and murderous uh, forms of anti-Semitism that we see today is from the white nationalist right. Um, you know, and you know, the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security are keenly aware of that. And I think we need to keep our eye on the, eye on the ball. Can I ask a brief question in closing? Sure. Um, I hope you won't think me too impersonal for leaving my camera off. Please go ahead. So, um, Thank you so much. Earlier, um, you spoke to some uh, sort of opportunities for solidarity, which I think is so important. And I love um, your kind of redirecting or reframing of the conversation in terms of, you know, where anti-Semitism anti is really happening, right? And putting this emphasis on white supremacy. Um, so I was wondering, just in closing, um, if there are any kind of intersectional or coalitional struggles against what you refer to as this culture of stigmatization that you're particularly excited about or inspired by? Um, yeah. Um, thank you very much for that question. Um, I, I think, you know, there's a, an important generational transition underway. Um, in this country, certainly in a community that I know well and am part of the Jewish community, um, where there is much more attention to um, the points of commonality that exist um, between, say, Jews and other um, uh, uh, vilified or marginalized groups in society. Um, and here, I just want to say that we have seen um, in this um, new political landscape, um, increasing prominence given to uh, Jews of color 
um, who are in a certain sense natural bridges between um, uh, different inter at, at sort of are uh, operate at uh, in that interstitial space, um, and I think it's in part our task to honor um, and give voice uh, to that long suppressed element within the Jewish community, which I think has a really important role to play in building uh, the bounds of and bridges of allyship. Um, there is a certain structural problem that I should just put on the table before we conclude. Um, and I'm not sure how to, um, how to resolve it, certainly I can't do it in the next five minutes, but it is this. Um, one of the recurrent features uh, of Jewish political behavior over the course of centuries and millennia, um, and one of the attendant consequences of uh, centuries and millennia of anti-Jewish expression and behavior is the what is known as the royal or vertical alliance of Jews. That is to say, their alliance with um, sources of political power uh, with the sovereign. Um, something which Hannah Arendt famously in um, um, her book Eichmann in Jerusalem uh, saw as the source of uh, murderous Jewish self-delusion. So committed were Jews to align with state power that they were unable to immure themselves from that um, and uh, either take flight or stand up uh, and fight uh, the Nazi monster. Um, I don't think Arendt's assessment is wholly fair, but one thing we have to be mindful of is Jews have historically aligned themselves with state power. Um, it was a significant factor in um, uh, the 25 percent or so of Jews who voted for Donald Trump in uh, the last election, um, really feeling as if um, it was important to align with state power. Not the only reason, but one of the reasons. Here's a real question an issue about allyship. If historically Jews have aligned with state power mm -hmm. as a means of self-protection, completely understandable, and in some, to a great extent, successfully so, and yet the potential allies with whom Jews would join in solidarity have always defined themselves in opposition to the state, and more importantly, have been defined by the state in opposition to the interests of the state, how do we uh, affect uh, that 21st century allyship? That's a really interesting question. Um, you know, it, it may require unlearning some habits, it may require um, uh, reformulating uh, what political power means and what its sources, top down or bottom up, uh, but that's a thorny issue. And it may be that the next generations, that is say not my generation, but my, my children's generation, and particularly so, you know, some of these uh, newly emergent uh, Jewish political activists like the Jews of, colors, uh, group, Jews of color groups um, will be able to do that uh, easier than, say, my generation or older generations. Before we... Um, Fabulous question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, a question? Is there an additional question? Um, well, okay. I, I no, I'm sorry. I was just yeah. oh, okay. I don't know what what I was going to ask in closing, or, or if there's another question, fine. But do you find more hope in the younger generation? More promise, I should say. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I I I do. Um, of course, I have my own concerns. I wouldn't be a parent if, if, I, if I didn't. Um, what I can say um, is that I think um, the generation of my children who are in their 20s, who are in their 20s, um, soon one will reach 30, um, uh, is that um, they are unshorn of some of the burdens that my generation and, and older um, possess. Um, and um, I'll just give one example. 
I belong, I think I'm, I'm in a certain sense, the last of a long generation, which, which really extends to my parents, to live with the very burning existential fear that somehow the Jews will not survive. It's a sensibility really that takes rise out of the ashes of Auschwitz. Um, I obviously wasn't there um, and was born after, considerably after uh, the end of the Holocaust, but I nonetheless belong to that generation for whom that existential question still burns uh, powerfully. Um, my children do not live with that existential question. Um, they live with a different reality. Um, sometimes I wish they had a little bit of that existential question, but they live unshorn of the burden and the pathology and the trauma uh, of the memory of the Holocaust. Um, and I think it allows them to see things um, and see potential partners um, and to act with a degree of confidence in ways that perhaps I and my generation cannot. Um, and so I do see very considerable hope, not just as a theoretical matter, but in actually w what I see on the ground um, in uh, the political activism of uh, the 20 and 30 something generations um, and the increasing engagement they feel in the political process in this country um, and uh, thinking um, uh, long and hard and creatively, sometimes more radically than I would or feel comfortable with, uh, about how to make this uh, a better society. Um, you know, I, I before uh, last night I went and looked at um, uh, I went and looked at the um, the mission of the University of Scranton and noticed that one of its uh, important uh, in Ignatian fundaments was. Um, the promotion of justice. Um, and uh, in concluding, I would just say that uh, I think we all can, uh, we all can welcome and recommit ourselves to that important Jesuitical, Catholic, Jewish, uh, human, universal uh, uh, aspiration. Uh, it looks like there's one more question, Mr. Johnson. Pardon me? I didn't hear what you. I. I, I mean, Another question. Go ahead, Mr. Johnson. Go ahead. It's, it's, um, David, thank you. I, I, you sort of answered my question or, or comment, and your what, what you said to uh, to your mother. Um, it's Mike Donahue. I'm Scranton. I'm a friend and colleague of, of of your father, and I just wondered if you took any hope from the defeat of Donald Trump. Um, uh, the Donald Trump has been a person who was happy to accept the, the support of white supremacists. Those people who say that they're Donald Trump said they're great people on both sides. When people are, are, are in a parade that would remind anybody of Kristallnacht and uh, the fact that America turned him away, although at a rather close election and embraced constitutional democracy, I think. Does that give you any hope to uh, Yes. Um, those, oh, those fears? Um, I, um, yeah, I don't want to now ignite a whole uh, conversation about uh, that particular question um, um, uh, because it would take us a very long time. But um, my own personal view is that um, Trump was both symptomatic of and a contributor to uh, that really toxic culture of vilification um, um, in which anti-Semitism has risen, um, as well as many other forms of group hatred and stigmatization. Um, and I feel a tremendous sense of relief uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, Joe Biden was elected. Um, in part uh, because I think Trump was uniquely capable of dog whistling, uniquely effective at dog whistling um, and stigmatizing. Uh, and because I think Biden himself really embodies the triumph of kindness over 
of her meanness. Um, and um, I would, at the same time, um, you know, we're a, we're a very divided country politically, extraordinarily divided. And I don't believe that every um, person who voted for Donald Trump, um, you know, is a racist or, uh, uh, you know, or knowingly participates in that culture of vilification or even unknowingly. Um, uh, so I think we, we, you know, now is not the time for gloating and, and boasting, but rather understanding um, and yet at the same time uh, clearly moving forward uh, out of what I think was an extraordinarily dark period in the history of this country uh, without precedent in my life. Well, I think that we're finished. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, do you hear me? Yes. Yes, we hear you. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, David, for being with us today and enlightening us in so many ways and giving us food for thought for the rest of the day or week. Thank you very much. <laughs>